I am not Jeff, in case you can't tell. <laughs> Online, I'm not Jeff. My name's Stephen Shaw. Thank you for being here today. Hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas. Wow, yep. this is not opening up. Okay. All right, so open to Ephesians 2. That's where we're going to be today. Appropriate uh, day after Christmas passage. <laughs> so we're going to get a little dark, but I believe it's important for us to do this sometimes. So like I said, my name is Stephen, and if you're wondering what I'm doing up here without a guitar, I'm wondering the same thing. Uh, I haven't done a sermon in probably six years, but I'm constantly talking about the gospel, so let's do this. And so I entitled this sermon today, But God. The gospel is offensive before it is redemptive. And so we've got to feel the sting before we truly get it. So I'm going to have to paraphrase this, okay? I've only got 20 minutes to lay down a lot of meat. And so my testimony real quick. I spent 30 years of my life living a Christian life, okay? Swimming in the kiddie pool of faith for a very long time. Um, so that was 12 years ago. I'm now 42 years old. I read through the Bible finally at the age of 30, and it changed my life. I was only a few books into the Old Testament when I beget, began, began to get really scared of God, okay? I lost Jesus for a second, Okay, let me explain. I'm laying in, in my bed, reading through something in the Old Testament, and I begin to tremble. I felt like if you looked at me, I was just like white and cold and just like afraid. Okay, I was under God's wrath for my sin. A light went on and said, I have been living this life wrong for a very long time. And then I heard it. Four times in my life, I've heard God speak to me, somewhat audibly, okay? Um, and he said, but my son but Christ. And I was like, oh yeah, I have salvation. I have Jesus. Thank you. Okay. But I, I had to get, be under the weight of my own sin for a second. So it's like, I, I lived this gospel story that I'm going to be talking about today within that 10 seconds, right? Feeling the sting right into, thank God I can worship. I can sing to my King. So I'm a big fan of the show, The Walking Dead. Any fans in here? Okay. So if you don't know what it is, it's a post-apocalyptic post zombie uh, story. I was really never into zombies. I could care less. You know, there's Walking Dead. It's not doesn't seem that scary. They're ugly and smelly. Um, but the show was really, it caught me, and it was really good. It's, it's more of a character development story, and, and the story becomes less about the zombies and more about the people. It's the evil people we're afraid of more than we are the zombies. It's kind of cool. It's a cool little twist. But I couldn't help. It wasn't even past the first season that I was... Every time I saw the zombies, I was like, that's me. That was me before Christ. Wretched. Only able to follow my own desires, my own path. Literally only able to gratify the desires of my flesh. And I thought, what a genius picture of being just alive enough to just pursue your own passions. Verse 1, Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Remember, Paul is writing to the church. Every letter in the Bible is written to the church. Okay, so this is a body of believers. This is God's people. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Ouch. Walking dead. <laughs> Trespass and sin. Did you know that not all sin is equal? A lot of people say all sin is equal. It's both true and not true all at the same time. Sin, even the Bible says it's not equal because there's different words, trespass, sin, iniquity, abomination. Okay, there, there's different levels of sin. Now, they are all equal in the sense that they all deserve wrath from God. They all deserve eternal separation from the perfect and holy one. So yes, gossip and murder are very different things. We can all agree on that, right? Um, but we still need a savior regardless of what our life is looks like. And so let's start back in verse 1. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Verse 2, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience. This is the church. They were dead before. I was dead before. Course of this world. So what is the course of this world? We all live in it. Most of us don't get the benefit of working in a church where you get to be surrounded by great God-loving people. Um, the course of this world is anything pointing you away from Christ. I spend most of my time talking to non-believers, people struggling, people searching for truth in their life. And so 
I'll have people after a few weeks, because I get to talk to the same people, so it's a real relationship development thing. It's cool. Um, they are like, well, what, like what, what's so wrong about tarot cards or, or horoscopes or you know, the psychic readings or, or these other religions that are, are making me a better person? And, and I tell them, well, first of all, you're settling for second best. Anything that's pointing you away from Christ is no good, because ultimately that's, that's pointing you to eternal separation from Christ. And so all these other things that you're looking to are second best. Why not go after the first best? Christ is the first best. So that's the course of this world. Anything that points us away. The prince of the power of the air. That's Satan and all his help. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Well, that's a cool band name, actually. Okay, I digress. All right. So we're a clueless bunch. Amen? All right. Verse 3. Among whom we all once lived, all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. A little children of wrath, too. No, okay. Born into sin. Okay, let me explain this real fast. We, I, I feel we emphasize our sin too much. Our sin's a big deal, needs to be taken care of, but we are born under the curse of sin. Adam cursed us from the get-go. From the start, born into it, don't care how good your life is, how well you strive to be good, great, we're born under a curse and we need forgiveness. So God from the start is working in our lives. Children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We were right in the lumps and we are no different than the rest of the world. Except if we follow God, we, are, we get that grace. The world pushing all the wrong things. Everything second best. Okay, so we got the picture, right? Dead, wretched, rotting, on our own. A great after Christmas message, I know, I'm sorry. But God, okay, verse 4, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. But God, that is the gospel in two words. Never do we see God show up and it's like, oh man, you just messed everything up, God. Right? God has always come to redeem, always come to make things better. There's nothing in God creates but God. Adam and Eve in the perfect relationship with him, face to face, they sin, should have been destroyed, but God. The Israelites enslaved for 400 years, no hope in sight, but God. Okay, continue, continue, all the way through the New Testament and the ultimate but God, Jesus comes and, and offers us eternal and final grace. So but God being rich, verse 4 again, being because of the great love with which he loved us, What's not being said here is almost just as important as what's being said. No mention of our good works. No mention of how lovable and cute I am. This is all God's doing. We do play a part, though, right? We are the subjects of his love. Amen? Yeah. Listen to the focus. The rich, mercy, great love. He loved. I love that. It is to him, through him. Um, it is from him, through him, and to him that we are saved. Verse 5, even when, we, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So not if you were dead, but when you were dead. It's not a question. What can a dead person do for themselves? I feel like I have to reiterate this a lot to like new Christians or like non-Christians that feel continually crushed by their sin. It's like, yes, feel that again, feel the sting. There needs to be change, but you can't do it on your own. You're not good enough on your own. That's fine, because Christ was. So dead, per dead person can do nothing for themselves, especially save themselves, eternal salvation specifically. But he has made us alive by grace. Did you know there's different kinds of graces? Okay, there's something called common grace. So the very mouths out there uttering blasphemes to God, God is sustaining that next breath of that person, right? That's common grace. We all receive common grace. But there's a very specific love and grace for his children that is like no other. Amen. So I love this fact that we're not just saved. God, Christ didn't just come and save us from our sin. That would have been cool enough, right? Experience some kind of relationship with God here. Great. But he dies and then rises again, which means we now are dead to our sin, alive in Christ, and still he goes on further and gives us eternal life with him, face to face with the one who demands perfection, and now we are the righteousness of Christ. I like to think of it as a really goofy illustration, but perfect father demands perfection. 
we're all dead and wretched, and then we receive the grace of God, and the Father puts on Christ goggles and now sees us as the righteousness of Christ. We are holy and pure in the sight of the one who demands perfection. That's ridiculous. And this is why we sing. This is why we lift our hands. This is why we praise Jesus because of this great grace that we don't deserve. Verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I love the reiteration over and over and over again. In Christ, in Christ. Don't forget. This isn't you. This is Christ. Love that. We for, we're, we're so easy to forget. This should make us in awe. The once wretched, blaspheming people who considered and are now considered worthy to sit with Jesus, it, with royalty on the stage of, you know, the creators? Like, come on, man. I, I'm just constantly in awe. Like, God, why me? Why such love to me? Okay, I've got to explain this seated thing, even if I go over time. It's, such a, I, it's something I... I we, we pass over. God, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Cool. Sounds like he's chilling. Like he deserves that, right? So, Old Testament, tabernacle. Tabernacle was basically a fancy tent that God told Moses to build so that he could be with his people. Again, the picture of God continually wanting to be with his people. Beautiful picture. God is in the details. God tells them exactly what material, material to use, what size to make it, everything that goes inside of it. God is about the details, too. That's still in our lives today. It's a great picture. My favorite thing, the one priest allowed to go into that tabernacle to make a, te a temporary t atonement for his people. Constant work for the entire week that he's in there. There's no, there's no time to rest. There's no time to sit. There's, time, there, there's constant work. There's candles that need tending and, and, the, and the bread of presence and just continual work to be done. Because the, the blood of lambs and bulls is not enough to cover our tone for eternity. Work's not complete. So Jesus comes, lives the life, dies the perfect death, raises, ascends to heaven, and now sits because the work is done. That is a beautiful picture. We get to rest with him in that picture. No longer influenced by the spirit of disobedience. We are influenced by the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. Verse 7. So that in the coming ages, he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. When in the coming ages? I believe Paul's talking about heaven here. Guys, we have no idea what to expect in heaven. We all have our own picture of it, and I think it's all very, very lame compared to what it's going to be. <laughs> we have no clue, the creativity and beauty and grace, and even just the fact that we could just look at Jesus face to face and say, thank you, and worship him forever. I mean, talk about a beautiful picture of grace. Immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards Christ Jesus. Can't wait. All right, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that one may boast. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This says so much. I could do a sermon on just the first part of that verse. But you might be thinking, if you're any kind of cynic like me, like you just told me it was grace alone, and all of a sudden faith alone. Are you adding stuff, right? We just got done with Christmas. Imagine the psychotic picture of people just sitting around and enjoying the wrapped present that they just are holding and really excited about this wrapped gift. But they just sit there, and the gift's wrapped and they just sit there all day, and then all year, and the gift's still wrapped, and like, look at this great gift I got. It's like, no, it does nobody no good. It's worthless without opening it up and enjoying that gift. Okay, so that faith is saying, God, I know what you've done for me is my only way to salvation. Jesus, you are my Savior. Okay, that's the faith part. I believe what you have done for me to be enough. Verse 9. Not a result of works, so that one may boast. And you know how much we would boast? We had any part in, in our own salvation. I know in myself. Anybody a new Christian here? Under five years? I know it might, it might be kind of embarrassing. Yeah, you don't have to raise your hands. Um, I know when I started growing in my faith, tell me if anyone's like this, please, or at least give me a nod. I just, I just might be the only freak here. Um, learning these things, right? Really diving in to the Bible, really maturing in my faith. And now I walk around and be like, 
I know some things. You don't know. I know you don't know about this thing. I love Jesus so much more than you because I know about this thing. Okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's not by our works. And we get this. We read this. Like, and that's with knowing these verses like this. And we're still like that. So thank God it's not by, actually by our works. And we, then we hopefully mature past that level and then have grace and love for everybody still. So um, our very belief is a gift. Remember that. Okay? It's not like all of a sudden we became smart enough one day and said, okay, now I believe in God. It's like, no, God's like, ting, all right, now you're going to believe in me. All right? All by him. Now, boasting and pride are not bad. We should be boastful, and we should be prideful in Christ alone. We boast about our Savior. We are prideful for the things that he has done for us, and hopefully we can't shut up about it. We need to share him. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So many action words. Workmanship. Some translations say masterpiece. We are the only creation that bears the image of God, anything of his likeness, which is such an amazing thing. And also a call to Christians. I don't care where somebody's at in their life. We love and respect them as image bearers of Christ. I don't care what they're doing. They're always image bearers of Christ. We love and respect them. We don't know what God is doing in their life, so we share truth. We don't sugarcoat it. We don't lie to them, but we love and respect them while sharing it. So many action words. Workmanship, created in, God's prepared. It's all God's actions. And then our actions, God, good works, walking in. Now, we aren't saved by our good deeds. This is a very sensitive scale here. We get too teachy on the works, and all of a sudden it becomes legalism, and now it's me earning my favor in salvation. We get too lenient on the works part and say, no, it's just by faith that you're saved. Well, yeah, but we, like James says, faith without works is dead. Our works is the response to this grace. Our good deeds is action that shows like, yes, I actually believe this to be true. Right? We can't just sit back in our comfy chairs. I was at the Sinopolis yesterday in the comfy lean back chairs. It was fantastic. But that picture of us leaning back and just being comfortable in our warm, fuzzy assurance of faith, well, that's not what Christ teaches. Right? The very world around us is literally headed to hell, separation from God for eternity, and we have the secret truth, we need to be sharing it continually. That's our proof that we believe what we say we believe. And to encourage you in good deeds. And know that when you're a Christian, because you're doing everything with the sole purpose of glorifying God, which should be the sole purpose of everything, everything you're doing is really, really good. Let me explain the contrast. Everything a non-believer is doing, good humanistically or not, is still no good. It sounds harsh. I don't care if you're Mother Teresa. If you're not doing it with the right purpose of glorifying God first, it's no good. Because that ultimately has no eternal significance, and we're not keeping the main thing the main thing, which is to glorify God forever. So be encouraged in your good deeds as you live out, no matter you, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, due to the glory of God, right? In 1 Colossians. All right, so we got this picture. We were dead. God made us alive. Zombies, beautiful people. God, Christ goggles, right? Righteousness of Christ. If you haven't accepted that gift, then yeah, you're still a zombie. That's my zombie walk. I don't know if I got across. Okay. Doesn't matter how much you're, you're praying and singing and coming to church, we need to open up the gift and live out those good works that God prepared beforehand. If this is offending you, I'm glad. Because again, the gospel is offensive before it is redemptive. We aren't getting it first if we don't, aren't offended by it a little bit first. Ouch. But God. He made the way for forgiveness, love, and salvation. All right, so then grand picture. This is my favorite, again, when I'm talking to my people, Bible studies and stuff. It's this slow progression. You see them gaining interest, answering the hard questions. And then they say, that final day when it comes is my favorite day. So what can I do to be saved? Like, what do I have to do? And I'm like, you've got to earn it. Work harder. Just kidding. <laughs> you have to admit that you're a sinner. And that, the, that who, a sinner that needs salvation. Acknowledge that Christ is the only way to that salvation. And then follow him with your whole life. And the most beautiful part about that is it's not us 
taking the reins and like trying our hardest to be a good person. No, the Holy Spirit now is awakened inside of us. He's being strengthened inside of us with all the reading and fellowship and worshiping that we do together. That's strengthening our spirit. Then we don't have to do it ourselves. It's all by him. We get the picture then, right? It's all Christ. Everything from ground zero to ground a billion, it's all Christ. We get to rest in it, but it's work. And there's good deeds, but it's all by his power still. You know, it's a circle of, of love and truth. For you were without hope, but God. Amen? Amen. Father God, thank you for this time to be able to stand up here as the biggest knucklehead I know, and you have just been working in my life, and I thank you that I get to open up your Bible and read your word in front of other people who are just wanting to see more of you, Lord. Pray that as we leave here today, we remember your sacrifice, that remember your grace, that we know that it is not by us, it's not by our power, it's not by our goodness or lovability, it is by you alone, Lord. Help do work in each one of our lives this week as we mature in our faith and continue to, to share boldly, but with love. Because it's not from us, it's from you, Lord. So just bless this next time of singing, in Jesus' name.